This is the reading of chapter 20, Lester Summerall's book, My Story to His Glory. Uh, please do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to give, there's two ways, PayPal and Cash App. It's a tremendous blessing when I see one of those come across. I greatly appreciate it. Chapter 20 is entitled, A Time of Adjustment. Louise and I were expecting our first baby and needed a place to call home. We bought a little house in Springfield, Missouri, which became our headquarters for the next several months as we continued speaking throughout America at conventions, camp meetings, and missionary engagements. Our first, first child, Frank, was born in Springfield on December 31st, 1946. I was almost 35 years old. During this time of seeking God's guidance for our lives as a family, I had the opportunity to revisit Europe. Taking the RMS Queen Mary, I sailed for Southampton, England, where I was shocked to see the destruction, especially where bombs had made direct hits on the Hampstead Bible Institute in London, effectively destroying it. The reunion with Howard Carter was a special time. He had escaped injury, but the emotional stress on him and the people of England was obvious. Many of them still seemed dazed. I took the night boat from Dover to France, where I revisited a number of churches that, and pastors that I had seen in better times. In Normandy, I wept to see the beach where our fighting men had landed and so many had died. Here, as elsewhere, entire towns had been erased from the face of the earth. It was a time of adjustment worldwide, and in my own private world of thoughts, I was doing much praying, studying the Bible, and seeking the will of the Lord. From France, I went by train across Switzerland into Italy. I was thankful for opportunities to speak to weary souls throughout many of these cities in Europe, but God was doing a work in my own heart, too. I was during, it was during this time that God began to urge upon me a plan for reaching the multitudes. I had been preaching since I was 17 years of age, and I'd been a missionary since I was 20. As I thought about the things I'd observed on my missionary travels, I realized that from 50 to 60% of all the nations in the world have one large city. If you were to raise up a great evangelistic center in that major city, you could touch the nation for Christ. Wow. I had seen every kind of missionary work under the sun, and I was often excited and disturbed at the same time. Many times I felt discouraged and weary, and my heart was broken. There was so much work to do and so few willing to do it. I had been in Shanghai, for instance, in a little church that seated about 50 people, but outside were 6 million Chinese souls in one city. I can't tell you how that burdened me. I knew that was repeated in many places throughout the world. I'd been there. I knew that many of the great cities of the world were virtually untouched with the gospel message. When I went through Central America, there wasn't a single full gospel church in any capital of the six republics. When I talked about this to our missions boards, asking them why they didn't go to the great cities, they would reply, Brother Summerall, it costs too much. I boiled on the inside like a volcano when I heard such weak excuses. I returned to the United States with a renewed vision and dedication. The Lord had shown me three things about reaching the nations for him. First, we were to bind the powers of the devil operating in that land. There is a compelling need on the mission field to shackle the powers of Satan and set people free. Jesus said to first bind the strong man, see Matthew twelve twenty nine. Second, after the people are set free from Satan's power, the new converts must be taught and settled in God's word. The fruits of a revival must be preserved. And third, Going into the capital cities, the heart of or the core of a country and erecting evangelistic centers would enable the people to be grounded in the word. Then they could go back to their own towns and villages to win their own kinsmen to Christ and establish their own indigenous churches. 
Back in the States, I was asked to conduct a revival in Memphis, Tennessee. While there, a call came to pastor a church in South Bend, Indiana. I had conducted successful revival crusades there many times in the past at the South Bend Gospel Tabernacle, but to be truthful, when the call came, I wasn't too impressed. I just didn't think there was any reason why the Lord would want me to settle down in such an unobtrusive town in the snow belt of America. A second and third call from South Bend people finally got me down on my knees, pleading with God to give me direction. The South Bend people told me that they had fasted and prayed and that the Lord had impressed upon them the need to remind me of their needs. The Lord confirmed that the call really was His and that the South Bend Church was to be my training ground to accomplish the goals the Lord had set on my heart. In December, Louise and I and our baby son arrived at our first pastorate. We assembled in a miserable, run-down, low-ceiling building big enough to hold at most 165 people. The casement windows squeaked and the roof leaked and the wind whistled through the building. I surveyed the situation and advised the congregation that I felt we should sell the building and start over. We moved into a large tent and held evangelistic services for 11 weeks. By the end of summer, we had three times more people than when we had began. God has blessed this venture of faith. We bought a lot on the corner of Michigan and Ewing, one of the finest intersections of the city of South Bend, and were able to raise $35,000 to pay for the lot. We then began to build... It was amazing to see God's leading us step by step and supplying our every need as we followed what we felt to be his direction. When winter came, we rented the third floor in a downtown building. By spring, the back part of our new church building was completed and we moved in. And by summer, we were able to occupy our new auditorium that seated a thousand. We named the new church Calvary Temple. Rex Hubbard and his family came to preach a revival for us, and we gained more new members, Oral Roberts, Clifton Erickson, William Branham, and many other evangelists came to help us. We rented city buses to bring people to the Sunday services. God helped us to capture the imagination of the people of the city, and we had over a hundred Sunday school classes. The church expanded so fast that we never stopped building. At the same time we were building the work in South Bend, I continued to be involved in missionary work around the world. In 1950, I took a six-week missionary tour once again to Europe, Africa, and the Orient, and I went to Israel, Egypt, and India for the first time. Charles Blair and Ernie Reb accompanied me on this trip. We usually conducted three-day citywide crusades. The highlight of this trip was the Crusade of Manila, the Philippines. This capital city was the home of several million souls. I was astonished that this Pearl of the Orient, there was not one aggressive full gospel church, even though full gospel missions surrounded it in the countryside. Most of the downtown government buildings still showed the signs of battle. The awful marks of war had left the city scarred and with a broken spirit, we rented Riesel Stadium and saw hundreds respond as we gave the call to give their hearts to Christ. But when we left, I was once again burdened. We had to leave them without leadership or a place to meet for fellowship. Back in the South Bend, where the work was growing and prospering, we were able to buy 10 acres of land and a lovely home on East Ireland. At the time, a country road. Not long afterward, having comfortably settled in and having consolidated the church and paid off its indebtedness, we were conducting a successful missionary convention when the Lord spoke to my heart. The world harvest was never out of my mind, and about three o'clock that Sunday afternoon of the convention, I was reminded of my long ago tormenting vision of the world going to hell. The voice of the Lord wasn't audible, but I knew he was saying to me, Lester, will you go to Manila for me? I found myself arguing with that still small inner voice, but Lord, the work is so great here in the South Bend now. 
You called me to this city, and I haven't finished my work here. God doesn't argue, but his gentle nudging is persistent. Lester, will you go to Manila for me? I felt honored and humbled by his pressure of divine destiny. Ecstasy flooded my soul like a river of heavenly blessing. The Spirit witnessed to my my heart that I was to say yes to God, that this was the will of God for Louise and me. We now had two sons, for on June 27, 1950, God has given us our second boy, Stephen. I came downstairs, embraced Louise, and said, Darling, we are going to Manila. God has assured me this is his will for us. Her first word was, When? Our church board and congregation found it difficult to believe at first, but they could see that the call of Manila burned hot within my bosom. Before us was the challenge of one of the world's great cities.